wherever you are. Welcome to our AGM 2021. My name is Osamu Yamamoto. I'm a president of Japan Alumni Club and your host tonight. Uh, the theme for this year's AGM is entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship education in Japan. Over the last 20 years or so, uh, Japan's entrepreneurship ecosystem has been dramatically transformed in a very, very positive sense. It will be beneficial for all of us to analyze where we are and discuss future outlook. To this end, uh, we have two excellent speakers from Booth. First, Dan Sachs, Dan. He's executive director at Polsky Center. He's in charge of education and a program. He himself is an entrepreneur and academic researcher. He will first walk us through what they are doing at Polsky Center in the field of entrepreneurship education. Dan, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. I'm uh, pleased to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about Polsky Center. Um, I'm going to share my screen quickly here. Uh, hold on. I have uh, a little bit more, more, more of the things to talk about. <laughs> All right. Well, I will wait. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. And uh, yeah, second, uh, you know, we have Professor Stephen Kaplan. Uh, no lengthy intro needed for Steve, as he's the academic superstar in the field of entrepreneurship and private equity. We will have the pleasure of having Steve uh, talking about what he sees in the current Japanese entrepreneurship and ecosystem and kindly share his perspectives on potentials of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship education in Japan. Steve, thank you very much for joining us. Great, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So we encourage all of you uh, to send your questions for Dan and Steve uh, via chat function. And uh, given uh, this special nature of this year's AGM, uh, this uh, session is open to alumni globally. For those who are attending uh, tonight from overseas, thank you very much uh, for joining us this session, despite the time differences. And last but not least, uh, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to thank Boost team, uh, led by our long-term friend, Kathy Sargon, uh, Senior Director of Global Advancement. Thank you, Kathy, if I may see your face. All right, yeah. All right, thank you, Kathy. For thank you, it's been, it's been, it, we're delighted to be able to bring um, Steve and Dan um, to the alumni. So thank you all for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Tonight's session wouldn't have happened without yours and uh, your team's, you know, passionate support. And we all grateful of that. Thank you. All right. Uh, sorry, Dan, uh, to have kept you waiting, but uh, let's get started. Whilst I will pass the baton to you. All right, great. I jumped the gun there. I apologize, uh, but uh, I am. I was so excited to be here. So I'm. I'm uh, share my screen and and talk to you a little bit about uh, the work of the Polsky Center um, and um, our role at Chicago Booth. Uh, I, I think first off, just to share with the group the breadth and and scope of the work that we do at the Polsky Center is to give you a sense that. Uh, we, we're responsible for uh, entrepreneurship and educational training, not just at the Booth School of Business, but across the entire University of Chicago ecosystem and beyond, including the two national labs that exist uh, in the Chicagoland area, uh, Argonne National Lab and Fermi Lab. So we interact with faculty, researchers, um, and, and folks all across the United States and around the world really uh, trying to share our experience and, and education, uh, educational opportunities around entrepreneurship. But of course, 
the core of what we do at the Polsky Center and at Booth uh, is around entrepreneurial education. And now, uh, more than ever, that is the number one uh, concentration at Booth. And we have a robust uh, group of faculty led by Steve Kaplan uh, that share their knowledge and use evidence-based research to uh, really provide students with a practitioner's view into the life of an entrepreneur and the requirements uh, to start and launch a successful business. And we do that not just through classroom training, but through experiential learning. Uh, I think anybody who has been an entrepreneur or knows an entrepreneur can appreciate that it's not enough to learn it in the classroom. You really have to experience it. And much of the curriculum that has been designed uh, really emphasizes the, the opportunities and the need to be engaged in real time activities to learn what it means to be an entrepreneur. And so we have a wide breadth of programs and resources for students, uh, alumni and uh, alike to help support the journey of an entrepreneur. And those include of course, um, our well-known business accelerator, but also um, large-scale conferences. We happen to host the largest entrepreneurship through acquisition conference in the United States. Um, so that's an extraordinarily exciting, robust program. We um, have established a venture capital and private equity lab course that allows students to work uh, as interns across the United States. Uh, for a term to um, be in, in person um, in, a, in, a, in an operating venture capital or private equity firm. Um, and then we have a, a real large team of entrepreneurs and residents, investors and residents to help support student journeys um, and help give them the kind of guidance and perspective that a trained um, an experienced entrepreneur can provide. And of course, we have a, a large staff um, that helps support students, alumni, faculty, et cetera. And so the Polsky Center is more than just um, a one, uh, one person shop. It's really a one stop shop to provide uh, entrepreneurial training in any way and, in, and across the board. And that extends um, more recently to the intersection of business and science. And so we now support um, faculty and researchers across the university uh, in, in all kinds of ways. And Booth students are deeply interested and engaged in that area. And so we have not just classes that help train researchers, um, but we have programs specifically designed to provide Booth students with opportunities to, um, to work with faculty researchers to uh, investigate potential startups to understand the business landscape, um, whether they're customers for products and um, provide researchers with the kind of support um, that only the Booth School of Business could provide. I think that's part of what makes the Polsky Center truly unique. In most universities, entrepreneurship is siloed in one part of the, one part of the university or another. Um, what makes Polsky Special is that we offer this kind of training across the university. So you get the benefit of what um, the Booth Business School has to offer uh, pretty much anywhere you are engaged at the university in starting a business or thinking about commercializing a technology. And one of the places where that has really, um, we, we've seen that flourish in, in that intersection of science and business is in a new quantum accelerator we started, which is housed at Booth, but of course is focused on quantum technologies. Um, and so that's really an exciting opportunity for us. It's actually the first accelerator in the United States focused solely on quantum technologies. Uh, we're in the middle of our first cohort right now, uh, and it's a partnership. Um, so it's not solely just Booth, although the Polsky Center leads this initiative, we partner with other it, but universities in the in the local area and national labs uh, and the community in Chicago. And we have startups in this accelerator from around the world. Um, and, and that's a really exciting 
uh, way that we see the Polsky Center extending its reach more broadly. And that has allowed us to really provide opportunity for our alumni to engage with the community of Booth students and, and faculty and researchers in ways um, that we think is really exciting because we know our alums are, are a source of rich history and experience, and we wanna provide pathways for you all um, to become more uh, supportive of our Booth students and startups in general. Um, both ones back in Chicago, but also um, regionally. Uh, so we have a lot of programs, including the Alumni New Venture Challenge Program, which is a business plan uh, accelerator, uh, but also um, interesting uh, opportunities at growth stage companies. And we're always looking to engage alums who, who want to um, provide their experience and guidance for, for our our students and other um, alums. And, and we hope that we'll be able to continue to engage with you all uh, going into the future. And, and we're really excited about that. Um, but, but of course, the, the, the granddaddy of them all is the New Venture Challenge. And I know um, Steve will be able to talk more eloquently about this than me, but the New Venture Challenge is the um, richest uh, startup accelerator in a university in the United States. Um, we have uh, been running this program for 25 years. Um, and as you can see, it's been extraordinarily successful. And I think what we've learned through that program, uh, which Steve will articulate, um, has really helped us support entrepreneurship across the entire university ecosystem. And it's a very, very exciting uh, program. And, and, and with that, I think I'll turn it back to you, Osamu, and, and start the, the more important conversation now. Thank you so much for giving me a few moments to, to share my, my story about the Polsky Center. Wow, excellent, excellent. Thank you, Dan. And uh, you did a wonderful, wonderful job for the people like me who are the old timers. I'm a class of 93. At that time, there was no Polsky Center. So <laughs> that's kind of updated uh, this cohort of the audience tonight, <laughs> right? Uh, what it is that you are doing at Polsky Center. So thanks for joining us. And uh, thanks for your excellent, excellent uh, introductory uh, remarks. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, once again, uh, ladies and gen gentlemen, uh, we tonight we have a pleasure of having uh, Professor Steve Kaplan with us. Thank you, Steve, once again, for joining us. Great, happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, I know it's very early in the morning. Indeed, 6.15, but uh, I'm usually up by now, so uh, it's not too bad. And that's very kind of you to say that. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Yeah, the older I get, the earlier I go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, uh, Steve, uh, like I said in the opening speech, uh, this year's uh, a theme that we chose for our AGM is entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship uh, education, potential of uh, entrepreneurship education in Japan. Okay. And a little bit of the background is that over the last 20 years or so, uh, Japanese uh, startup ecosystem, if you will, i.e. the entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, angel investors, regulators, academic researchers, all those oh, uh, that, that consists of this uh, ecosystem has been significantly improved and the resulting in the situation where young talents uh, can build his her own business in Japan, much, much easier than before, right? And I, I, I'm, I'm very, very much encouraged by that. But, you know, um, before getting into uh, the, you know, uh, asking you the, you know, your view about the Japan situation, uh, allow me to go back a little bit of the history, uh, if you will, of their entrepreneurship education at Chicago, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, like uh, Dan said, uh, you, uh, first of all, uh, you know, co-founded a uh, new venture cap, a uh, new venture challenge, uh, what, 25 years ago? Mm-hmm, indeed, 1996, 97. Yeah, that's a long time ago, right? But, you know, <laughs> at that time, you know, even, uh, you know, even now, and then at that time, you know, uh, furthermore, it's a Chicago, there's a Chicago approach, right? Uh, which is very theoretical. 
Whereas uh, entrepreneurship, it's by nature, it's more like animal spirits kind of, uh, you know, con- <laughs> perception, ah. right? So, you know, my first question to you is uh, what really motivated you to uh, co-found NVC at Booth and the more fundamentally the uh, entrepreneurship education program at the University of Chicago? So, yeah, I'm uh, sorry to say it was sort of accidental initially. <laughs> Right. Uh, and then, and then it, ch- it became a little bit more or less accidental. So, so it started in, in 1996, uh, a colleague and good friend of mine, Paul Gompers, had been teaching entrepreneurial finance, and uh, he decided to go back to Harvard where he's gotten his PhD. Right. And Bob Hamada, who was then dean, said, you uh-huh. know, I need, I need someone to teach entrepreneurial finance. Um, and... I, I was teaching corporate finance then. He said, I can find someone else to teach corporate finance. I can't find anyone else to teach this course. Will you teach it? Mm-hmm. And so I said, sure. Um, <laughs> I just gotten, I had just gotten tenure and, and I was, uh, you know, I was open to doing something else. So, so that was the accidental po- uh, part that Paul Gompers left. And then, um, yeah, first year I'm teaching it, a student comes to my office, a guy named Jeff Meyer. And he says, um, Steve, um, some other schools have started business plan competitions. Could we do one? Mm-hmm. And, and I, you know, said, well, I don't want to do any work, so you need to do all the work. Um, <laughs> but, but if you do the work, I'll, I'll find you some judges and find you some prize money. Right. And so I found prize money and uh, I think it was like $25,000, you know, which is, uh, it's t- this year it was $1.7 million. So, uh, you know, we've, we've come, <laughs> we've done a little bit better over time. Uh, and, um, and that's how the, the new venture challenge got started. And then entrepreneurship was a, a little different. You know, after I started teaching it mm-hmm. and, and enjoyed it, Bob Hamada, who is the real the real visionary, basically said like a year later, he said, um, sh- you know, business schools will not survive in the next 25 years without doing entrepreneurship seriously. Right. And so Chicago needs to have a serious entrepreneurship program. And you're the only tenured person who has anything to do with entrepreneurship. So you're going to run it. <laughs> <laughs> so so I said okay and uh you know there then we we just built it you know through hiring uh you know it's not so much me I hired Ellen Rudnick who was spectacular I hired Star Marcello who was spectacular and then we hired Dan uh who is uh going to be spectacular so uh that's uh that's how we've uh you know progressed wow thank you Steve uh, that first of all, I didn't know until today that it was Bob Hamada who was visionary on this perspective, right? Yeah, indeed. He deserves a lot of credit. I see. He was a dean uh, when I was a student there. So, uh, yeah, I had a very fun memory of uh, getting his, uh, you know, listening to his speech. But, you know, I didn't know that part. Mm-hmm. And also that accidental part is, uh, you know, like, you know, it's so like uh, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship <laughs> education. Huh? <laughs> uh, it was, uh, you know, so in a sense, Chicago was so lucky that uh, it was uh, right after you got the tenure, right? And uh, that was really accidental <laughs> that uh, uh, you you have that kind of a latitude and the Chicago has that kind of latitude. That's, that's good to know. Okay, although I like to think ten, tenure was less accidental, but I don't know. I know, I know. <laughs> I didn't mean that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for pointing out. <laughs> That's not what I meant. I know, I'm teasing, <laughs> teasing, teasing. But anyway, uh, oh, uh, before we move on, uh, uh, please, ladies and gentlemen, if I know you have a lot of questions and comments for Steve, uh, so please use you, your uh, chat function and Q&A function uh, so that, uh, you know, the, the Bruce uh, staff can pick, pick your question and uh, uh, let, let me ask your question for Steve. Uh, that's, uh, that's how we work uh, tonight. So move on. Uh, so what do you the current assessment of the ed- uh, entrepreneurship education at Bruce, uh, including NVC? 
So that's where it's 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 kind of a nice mix of you know you you said you know it's not theoretical it's very empirical but it's evidence based so I think what what you can do with entrepreneurship education is is I can't necessarily tell you you know how to come up with an idea right the idea the creativity you have to bring to it but once once you've got an idea what entrepreneurship education can do is is massively increase the likelihood that you succeed so right. there are a lot of things you can do with a startup um, that you know will will help it be successful and there are a lot of things you can do that are just mistakes and so i think what we we do over time is you know we get better and better at helping people figure out here's what you should do and here's what you should avoid doing and we now as dan said we now have 30 courses that are part of entrepreneurship uh taught by a lot of faculty and uh, those courses include you know there's entrepreneurial marketing there's entrepreneurial finance uh which are you know evidence evidence-based there's digital marketing courses that are very you know um you know technical uh i would say uh and then we have entrepreneurial sales because you you don't have a business you know you, you can have a great idea if you can't sell it you, you don't have a business so that's a very and that's a very um sort of nose to the ground very um you know granular course that uh, people actually practice selling so there's really a wide variety of courses from you know things that are technical to to things that are are less so and um it's uh you know it's 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 kind of it's terrific and it's uh you know as dan said it's the number one concentration uh at booth and uh we continue we have great teachers uh and uh we get great students and then you know the the sort of the the you know what what is is probably our our you know biggest asset is the new venture challenge which right. started you know as i said in 19 first time we ran it was 1997 and it is what's what's unusual about it it's just it's just an amazing process and i'll explain it a little bit if, if you'd like me to how it works um and it's, it's, it's a course and it's a, a business accelerator so what happens is in the in the fall we spend a lot of time trying to get students together so students right. who have an idea who may want to work with a student uh, who can who has expertise we also you know as Dan said try to put students together with scientists so that they can marry you know a technology with with some business uh, acumen and they put the teams together in the fall and then in the winter they submit a business plan and the business plan you know is is preliminary it comes at the end of January and we get some years 60 some years 90 but sort of somewhere between 60 and 90 and then what we do is we pick the plans that are promising so we only let in every year we let in about 30 plans if we if we saw 60 that we liked we'd let them in but we usually it's about 30 and what's really important in in any accelerator is that you you don't have plans that are you know dead on arrival i like to say if you have bad plans it's demotivating to everybody and so what you really want are plans that could succeed and so we get about 30 and then what we do is we introduce them to the network so right. we introduce them to people who can help them so if somebody's uh you know basically we'll tell them you know who could be helpful to you and then you know when they tell us we say oh good i'm going to introduce you so i'm you're now in my network you know asamu so when i when i get a japanese plan now 
I'm going to introduce them to you if it's uh, if it's relevant. And that is has been amazing. The alumni have been amazing when we and now that you have Zoom, it's a lot easier to get a meeting. Yeah. And and so it really is amazing when you introduce the students to like very senior people who give them time and it kind of is stunning to the students that that people will talk to them right. and then and it's good fun for the alumni because the plans are interesting right yeah. so it's sort of it's a win 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 and it gets better every year mm -hmm. and then what they do is in April, the class starts and each team presents and they present to the other students, but also we have about 15 entrepreneurs and investors in the class who they present to and they get really, really tough feedback. I mean, the first time they present, they're, they're really, um, <laughs> they're kind of shocked at how, at how nasty and tough the feedback is. But it's, it's really effective because it's like, you know, it's going to a personal trainer who beats you up. You know, the personal trainer makes you work hard, but then you get into good shape. So it's really, really important that uh, uh, that happens. Then they, they, they fix the plan based on the feedback they present again in May, and they're much, much better. And then we take the top 10 and they make the finals, they present again, and they're much better again. So it is, it is just magical what happens. And at the end, I mean, I was just, I had lunch yesterday with a, a friend of mine who's a, a very prominent venture capitalist, and he was a judge this year, and he just said, he just said it was amazing. He said, how, do you, how, did, how did you get them to present so well? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, we have a very good process. So um, it is just, you know, magical. And so being involved, it's just, it's such a privilege. The students are wonderful. The alumni are wonderful. And uh, it's, it's, it really, it's just, you know, it's the only way to uh, describe it as magical. Um, and the learning is amazing. Even the teams that don't make it, they learn a ton um, through the process. So, so that's terrific. And then, you know, this year we gave out $1.7 million. So the, the prize money is really an investment. And so between the school and the judges, uh, they got $1.7 million, which is actually the biggest investment pool of any uh, business plan competition in the United States, and I would guess the world. Um, and, uh, you know, and as you saw, you know, the outcome is we've, you know, had a lot of teams that have uh, gone on to success. And uh, we've had several that have been worth, uh, you know, Grubhub was billion dollar exit. Uh, uh, yeah. Braintree Venmo was uh, almost a billion, and we've got uh, a few others that are well into the hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, so, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's been very good. And then what we've also done, because it was so successful, we now have a college new venture challenge for the college uh, that Star Marcello runs. Uh, we have a social new venture challenge. So if you have a social mission, uh, you, can, you can do that. Uh, we have a global new venture challenge for our XP students, uh, and then we have an alumni new venture challenge uh, for alumni, and uh, all of them uh, have been. Uh, again, the, they're they're not the the prize money is not uh, the same as the the regular new venture challenge, but all four of them uh, have been uh, doing well, and uh, again, get a little bit better every year. Thanks, Steve. Uh, that's very, very, uh, you know, educational for the audience, right? Uh, who <laughs> doesn't know uh, how, you know, how this uh, NVC uh, process really uh, going through. And thank you for walking us through in, with such a details. Uh, so uh, my next question is, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, you said they was uh, Bob Hamada, who was visionary uh, about uh, 25, 20, you know, 30 years ago about this uh, entrepreneurship education at Chicago. So what, vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis data vision, what do you see, uh, you know, uh, uh, the entrepreneurship education at the University of Chicago in 10 years? What are the potentials that uh, you see in the next 10 years? 
So, so I would say first, I mean, I think we, we have a good strategy, we have good resources, and it's really executing on what we have and getting better. So right. I think the, the New Venture Challenge will, will continue. I think the College New Venture Challenge will get better. And I, and I should add, I don't know if every, all the alumni know this, but we now have a business economics program at the college. So yeah. not only do we have the, the MBA program, we also teach in the college. Okay. And, and that now, business economics, I think may be the most popular major in the college. If it's not the most popular, it's, it's in the top two or three. Um, which means we're getting not only awesome students at the business school, but awesome students at the college. And for those of you who have kids who want to go to school in the United States, it's also something to think about. Uh, and, uh, you know, which is, is also, you know, you know, very you know, interesting because I now have, you know, former students whose kids uh, go to the college and, uh, and, and the business school. So that's the, that's the uh, I don't know, good or bad thing about getting older uh, or having been here a long time. So I think, you know, just executing, continuing to execute and execute better on our different tracks and, and bringing in more good people uh, to the entrepreneur in residence, investor in residence, uh, et cetera, um, to uh, doing a better job translating the science. So that's where, you know, the quantum accelerator is an example of that, where the, our big winners in the New Venture Challenge have been uh, apps or consumer products, and it would be good to get some hardcore technology. This year, the, the second place winner in the New Venture Challenge was a, was a science-based uh, startup out of uh, the uh, molecular engineering uh, department that uh, was developing a, a vaccine to prevent peanut allergies. So that's, um, you know, if that's successful, that would be uh, a very cool thing. And then I think the third thing to think about um, is now that the world is, is on Zoom and, you know, things sort of, it's a much tighter world, we might, you know, figuring out ways to, to do things um, a little bit more uh, virtually. We'll see. That's uh, the New Venture Challenge was, you know, largely virtual last year and it worked very well. So those are those are three things that uh, are on the the horizon. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Dan, thank you, uh, Steve, and uh, just to uh, you know uh, uh, follow up question to that point is that uh, what is your perspective about uh, you know the potential globally? Uh, now you're uh, you know this is part of uh, Japan Club's uh, uh, AGM, and uh, there are you know Asian Pacific uh, based alumni is attending uh, your session tonight. So what do you see the potential of uh, entrepreneurship education in this region? I mean, I think the, the number one, uh, we, the alumni new venture challenge. So it's not necessarily education, but it's, it's certainly open. I think we, we have an Asian uh, arm to that. So uh, that's one. Mm. Two, I, 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 you know, I know we'll try when Hong Kong opens up, um, yeah. we will do, I think we'll do some, we have some programming uh, in entrepreneurship there. Uh, and Dan maybe uh, uh, can weigh in on that. And, um, and then, you know, we'll see whether we do things, you know, on, uh, you know, Zoom related where, uh, you know, th those have been, you know, whatever the, the you know, things like this and, uh, I know there's been, you know, a bunch of programming. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, that's pretty much the uh, end of our first section. That was a little bit of the history of, the, if you will, uh, the entrepreneurship education at University of Chicago. So move on to the second topic, which is your perspective about uh, uh, the current Japan situation. So, uh, as I briefly explained to you, uh, from my perspective, uh, you know, there's a, a you know, huge transformation uh, of the Japanese startup ecosystem over the last 20 years. So uh, my first question to you uh, is, uh, you, know, you are the long time observer of Japanese startup ecosystem and uh, you know, venture capital uh, you know, industry. So uh, what do you see in the current situation and are you, uh, optimistic about the future of Japanese startup ecosystem, and if you give us a reasoning, uh, if you uh, give us a reason why, 
that would be wonderful. Okay, so I think I, I would share your optimism. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there are a few reasons for that. So, so first of all, <clears throat> I definitely see interest from younger people. And uh, you'll be happy to know, actually, each of the last two years, uh, we had we had Japanese teams in the New Venture Challenge, meaning it was uh, Japanese students who had uh, an idea to start companies in in Japan. Neither one of them, you know, ended up going forward. But the fact that you know we had students from Japan who who actually had interesting startups yeah. is 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 a very good sign. Two years in a row, and they were they were good students. And I should add um, that the <clears throat> one of the students on the uh, the team for the peanut allergy uh, was also a Japanese student who who went back to Japan so uh, um, so there's actually you know at booth um, with the the group of Japanese students they're clearly entrepreneurial so so that's so I see that um, two I think you know in Japan you can't miss you know SoftBank and uh, <laughs> Sayoshi son right and the, the fact that he gets so much attention has right. to trickle down to uh, people wanting to be like him. And um, so that's two. Three, what's, what's probably you know, most important um, is you know, with the change in technology and then the shock from COVID, you, right. know, you, you need tech solutions, right? In, in both IT and life sciences, and Japan has a great deal of strength in both. And I think companies, I mean, the big thing in Japan is, is whether you know, society will let you innovate um, in, a, in a startup. And I think you know, companies are more willing than in the past to try new technologies because of you know, the, the competitive pressures, because of the COVID shock. I think it's just inevitable. I mean, it's been true um, I think everywhere, but it's, it's probably more, more helpful or at least as helpful in Japan. And, and then y'all you know, talk about one other thing that I don't, you know, um, Sozo Ventures, have you heard of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Sozo Ventures is, is led by uh, Kochiro Nakamura <clears throat> and Ko did the new venture challenge three times. He did it twice as a student, and then once he, he was involved as an alum. Right. And, and he started Sozo Ventures, which is, is very, very clever and very encouraging because what, what he did was he, he has as his investors a number of Japanese corporations. Yeah. And then what he does is he brings U.S. companies that are scaling to those companies and says, would you be a customer? So he kind of facilitates the Japanese companies using new technology. So he brought Palant, he invested in Palantir and brought it to Japan. He invested in Coinbase, he invested in Square, um, he invested in, in a number of others uh, that are very successful. And, and the Japanese companies have been willing to experiment and become customers of those startups. So that's actually a good sign that the Japanese companies are kind of willing to do that. And it's been a very successful model. And in fact, Co was just named, there's something called the Midas list that Forbes does um, that ranks the top 100 venture capitalists in the world. And Co was, they, were, they had two or three new ones this year. And Ko was one of them. He's one of the top 100 venture capitalists in the world. And he's the only, only uh, person from Japan on that list. Uh, and he's a you know, Booth alum, I think, 2008. So um, it's, uh, it's really uh, spectacular. So I think you know, those, are, those are all things that I think make me uh, optimistic. And uh, they're, uh, you know, let's hope we're right. Thank you very much uh, for very encouraging, uh, you know, comment over uh, Japan situation. And I really do hope that, uh, you know, uh, uh, our optimism is really coming into reality pretty soon. And, uh, and I, I'm sure that uh, 
Boost alumni and the Boost student will be a very important part of that uh, integral process. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it looks like we have a couple of questions before I want uh, to, from the audience. But uh, before I open up for that, uh, let me take the liberty of being the uh, you know facilitator of tonight, uh, and uh, I want to ask a personal question for you. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I'm, my job is, uh, I, I'm a long-term private equity investor. <laughs> I'm a buyout. I am a buyout guy. And you inspired us, me, to be one. <laughs> and uh, for me, you are really the foremost private equity scholar in the galaxy. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, in, in, in a chat uh, we had previously, I well remember the time that I read your paper, you know, we are all handy Kravis now. That was a phenomenal paper, all right? And uh, we do use uh, your, you know, uh, Kaplan Shore PME, uh, you know, uh, joke aside. Uh, it's it's so a good. industry standard uh, by far in this market. So, uh, you know, uh, with that background, uh, let me ask you this question. Um, what a, potential academic themes do you see in the Japanese private equity market uh, at this moment? So I think it's it's similar a little bit to, to what we talked about on venture. Um, you've got very intense competitive pressures. Yeah. Um, the technological change is intense. And there are a lot of companies in Japan that can, can probably benefit from improving. And, and if they don't, it'll be a problem. And what, what's happened over time, which has also been very, very impressive, is the private equity firms, buyout firms, you know, used to be all about cost cutting. Yeah. And, or not all about, but largely about cost cutting. And, and that has really changed over time. Um, and the, the, the global firms now have put a lot of energy and effort into operational engineering, which is, is not just about cost cutting. It's about how do we do marketing better? How do we do sales better? Can we, do, you know, can we put in IT? Can we um, do many things? And when you ask them you know, where they expect to get their value, um, the, the, the number one and number two by far are not cost cutting. What they say now where they're gonna get their value is growing revenue, right. number one, and number two, better incentives because mm -hmm. private equity gives, gives very good incentives to uh, the, the management. And so, so it's not you know, the barbarians coming in any longer. It, it's much more sort of people coming in who are gonna help you. Right. And, and that, that is, I think that's much more palatable to, you know, to a company, particularly in Japan, where, you know, that's, and, uh, um, you know, it's not to say there's no cost cutting, but there's some cost cutting, but there's also growing. And, um, and they're very good at putting in technology. They're very good um, at, uh, you know, improving the company. So, I mean, I should ask you, you know, what you think about that since you're doing it, but um, that's been my sense, and you see that, you know, Bain Capital in Hitachi Metals, uh, KKR Asia in Sayu, and, and by the way, one of our alums runs KKR, KKR Asia, uh, or doesn't, is one of, runs KKR Japan, uh, and um, so, so I'm kind of um, more optimistic because the, the, the private equity people are not viewed as the, as the raiders any longer, but they're really partners. Mm. Yeah, thanks for the, uh, you know, that's really a fact base that uh, you've been publishing uh, uh, in your, you know, excellent papers. And that's really encouraging a backup, uh, strong backup from uh, intellectual, uh, you know, bodies like, uh, you know, uh, gurus like yourself. And that's really, uh, you know, our intention. As a private equity uh, professional, we really would like to do number one and number two uh, in, the, you know, those two items uh, in working with uh, the portfolio companies. So uh, that's a huge difference, yes. Uh, uh, by the time that I read your, you know, uh, that paper back in 98, I believe, and, uh, and the current uh, private equity. <laughs> so uh, I really appreciate your, you know, uh, the uh, uh, intellectual backup uh, for that aspect. It's a, it's a fact-based. Indeed, indeed. Okay, 
thank you. Uh, that that was a really a privilege of me asking that particular question. But uh, let's open <laughs> up for the question from the audience. So uh, Leon Tsumi, uh, he asks, his question is this: I, I'm interested in the fact that Boost is uh, nurturing science-based startup ecosystem. What is the context behind this? Are there any opini uh, uh, opinions, recognitions that science-based startups are discouraged and or less successful in the past? So, so this also, I think, comes into uh, changing attitudes. I would say 20 years ago, yeah. there, there was an attitude in the sciences, particularly at University of Chicago, that, that business was, was bad. Um, or you know that that research should be pure, and now increasingly, when you hire scientists, they want to they want to take their science and uh, bring it to people and commercialize it. So I think the the demand from the scientists has has increased a lot over time, where they see the good that their right. science can do in the world, and then second, we have not been well organized at the university to, to take the science out that's there. So uh, the two things, I think the demand has increased and, and we can be better uh, about taking the science out. And the new president of the university, <clears throat> Paul Alvisados, uh, comes from Berkeley and he's, a, he's like a, a Nobel Prize caliber chemist who started two, I think, nanotechnology companies um, at Berkeley. So he's, I think, very motivated uh, and interested in doing a better job as well. So, so we'll see, but that's, the, that's a challenge. And, and there's certainly very good science um, all over the university that uh, you know, we should be able to, to do something with. Yeah. That's another potential for the you know, next 10 years, right? Yeah, yeah, and Argon, which we, which is the national lab that we run, it's very hard to to get things out of the it's government run. But again, they're more motivated, and I think the government is too. So you know, those are those are opportunities. Yeah, thank you. Then the next question is from uh, Akira Suenaga. Uh, I hear that Professor Kaplan and his team have successfully developed framework or system to support a startup idea to get up and run. But my gut feelings tells me that if such support succeeds or not, depend on how good the startup idea uh, is, uh, ground gel or garbage. I guess uh, uh, you, your team has along the line developed a set of judging criteria to judge if a broad in startup idea is a potential ground gel or garbage. So I wonder if you could uh, share with us such lessons learned. So <clears throat> there, I, I think to, to have a successful startup, uh, there, there are two things. You have to have a, a very good business idea. And so think of that as the horse. Uh, and you need a good jockey, which is the, is the team. And, and as I said earlier, it's really important that in the, the new venture challenge, you only let in uh, businesses that have a chance. And right. so I have, I have a framework, I call it outside impacts. I, I teach it in my course and you know, there, there, there are a bunch of pieces to it, but I, I would say the, the key pieces are, are number one, uh, you, you have to have a product or service that, that customers want. And so the, you know, what you, you really, the first thing you wanna do is establish that there's demand. And so, you know, the first thing we tell the students is, is go talk to customers, you know, and go find out if the customers are going to buy what you're selling. And it's funny because some, some people like say, oh, they have this great technology and uh, they don't talk to customers. And so, so number one, you know, talk to customers and make sure there's demand. Number two, and I, and I don't know if these are, you know, these are, these are equally important. You know, you have to have some, some sort of, uh, um, something that's, that's, that's differentiating or, you know, a sustainable advantage, you know, why, you know, even if it's a good idea, you're going to customers, why are you going to win? And so that's where, okay, if you do have a better technology, okay, we understand that if there are network effects and you can, 
uh, use them, uh, that's good. But you want to, you know, those are really the two things is number one, you know, is there demand? Number two, you know, do you have something differentiating that's going to, you know, make you a winner? And then three, you know, you, a team that has the right skills. And right. those are the three things, you know, that we look for. Um, and that's, you know, when you go through uh, the competition, the teams that win uh, are generally teams where we're, you know, number one, it looks like they have customers. Uh, and, uh, and then if they're, you know, a good team, then, you know, that's, that's part of how they uh, present well and think clearly. That's how you show uh, you're a good team. And then, you know, ideally they have something that's differentiating. So I'll give you, I mean, Grubhub was a good example um, because that was one where they were very early to um, getting, uh, you know, takeout, you know, on the internet or mobile. And there's a big first mover advantage there. And they were in Chicago, they were really first to get all the restaurants. And once they had all the restaurants online, then they got the customers. And once they had the customers, the consumers and the restaurants, you know, there was a real first mover advantage. It was hard for anybody else to come in. And, uh, and then it turned out they could do it in other cities. But at the time of the New Venture Challenge, they'd really won Chicago. And uh, that, was, that was, you know, very important. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. You know, the, you know, as a long-term uh, cash flow investor, it's all uh, the difficulty that I have <laughs> talking to the young entrepreneurs is that, you know, Osamu, uh, we need this amount of money and we have to put this amount of money first uh, because, uh, you know, competitors are there and we have to take advantage of, uh, you know, first mover advantage and, uh, you know, the last uh, comes along. So the, our cash ban is going to be this, and uh, you have to put in another this amount of money. That kind of discussion, you know, wow, kind of a <laughs> thing for the people like me. But your, you know, three criteria is, uh, you know, uh, no magic question, right? <laughs> is your customer, and is it uh, is what you're doing differentiated enough? And the first three, you have a great team, you know. That's understandable. And that makes me very comfortable to be part of your X system. <laughs> I, I should say fourth, then, then you have to show us you can make money over time, right? That's, that's important, yeah, because you are going to lose money at first. That, that's important, but that's, that's probably the, the first three things are, are more important. The other thing that's interesting, too, is, is that I think there are different, are different personalities. I'm, I'm much more of a value person like you are. Yeah. So, you know, and, and that's how I think, but there are, and there are other people who think like, like growth in the future. And, and I think they're, they're, they're somewhat different. So like if a student tells me I'm interested in both venture and, and private equity, I go, no, no, you really, those are kind of different. You kind of have to decide who you are and, and do one or the other. I can teach both. I'm not sure I would do the, uh, you know, if I were not teaching, I would be more on, on your side than on the, the venture side, but I, I can teach both. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And uh, oh, here's a question from us in Sato. Japan's government spent a lot of money for programs to encourage academia, researchers, and scientists to be entrepreneurs. Yes, but it was not so successful after now. Any prescription or any advice? So I don't know exactly uh, what, they, what they do or what they did. Um, what, what I think is important and, and uh, you know, is, is something, you know, we do in the New Venture Challenge. And I think it's something that, that if you look at research uh, that others have done, they find is, is anytime you do something where you're trying to kickstart entrepreneurship, you really need to make sure market forces are operating. So you don't want the government to pick the winners. You really want the private sector to pick the winners. So setting up things where maybe the government puts in some resources, but the, the choices are made by the venture investors or angel investors who are putting their own money up, 
that's really, I think, where you get um, more um, success. And you also you also have to be willing to 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 kick out the losers. So, and that that's also something where I think government it's a little hard for government to do that. And so, you know, that's what's the the more you know, really, the tougher you are the more success you tend to have, but it's very hard to be tough. And even in, in, in the, the universities, you know, there are some courses, oh, we let everybody in. Oh, we don't want to hurt people's feelings. And, and that's just stupid. It, you know, sorry for that word. You really have to, you have to pick winners and losers and, and that motivates the winners. And then again, when you just have winners, that attracts people, um, that attracts talent. If you have losers in there, um, it's demotivating to the you know investors. It's demotivating to everybody. So if I had to guess, uh, that's what I would would guess. Yeah, thank you, Steve. And I have uh, one more uh, one more question uh, from uh, from uh, uh, Hideaki Fukazawa. Uh, what is your advice to senior person, say in mid sixties, who has no experience of a startup, nonetheless eager to start? Uh, his her business plan. Is that uh, is that advice may change change the age of starting? I mean the uh, uh, the is there any uh, you know diff, uh, the, your advice uh, would your advice may change uh, if uh, according to the age? That's so. I would say number one, if you know your business, so if you know the space you're in and the, the older you are, you, you probably know your business. So that's good. Number two, you know, if you get customers or, or show people you're gonna get customers, that's really important. So, so there you've got customer and team and maybe something differentiating. And then you have to convince somebody to give you money that, that there, there may be, you know, I don't know a bias for some against somebody older, you know, get a younger, you know, get, get, get someone who's younger as a, a partner or co-founder and, uh, and then go do it. Thanks. But actually that's what the John Ehara, whom you, who, who's your friend, uh, did. <laughs> ah, <laughs> wow. Right. Uh, he, he was uh, my long-term partner and ah. uh, he, 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 when he started, he was at the age of uh, 46, 7 or something. Yeah. And he chose a younger partner for that. For that. And, and he followed your advice, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Last question from uh, Ken Mori. Okay, this is a good one. How do you compare the Boost program with those of Harvard, Stanford, and so forth? I mean, the an education, uh, entrepreneur uh, educational program. I mean, we're, we're pretty, pretty spectacular now. I think, I mean, 30 years ago, we didn't have much and, and Harvard and Stanford did. Stanford is different. Stanford Business School has, you know, is in that ecosystem. So a lot of the students who go there, um, you know, they, they, they go hang out with the, or talk to the, the VC firms in, in the area and they uh, do, um, they also have Stanford engineers running around. So. Uh, that's an advantage Stanford has in terms of what they teach. I think the the programs that we have are actually better than Stanford Business School. Um, you can ask our dean. Uh, if you ask uh, Madhav Rajan, who who was the deputy dean at Stanford, uh, he came here and was was very. Uh, I don't know if he was surprised, but he was. Uh, he he said, "Gee, you, you guys are doing more than we do at Stanford Business School." So. I think you know Stanford has has the the Bay Area ecosystem. I think we have better programs. Harvard's very good. Um, Harvard has uh, they I don't they don't they don't have anything like the New Venture Challenge. So the New Venture Challenge is is really I think is is the best of its kind in uh, you know probably the world. And um, that's that's really good. Harvard Harvard has has very good stuff. And you know. Paul Gompers, my my friend, is there, so uh, they're they're good. I think you know, relative to a Wharton Kellogg, you know, Kellogg, where we just much much better, and I think Wharton uh, as well. So so I think we're 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 doing you know very well. We can do better, and and we hope to as we go forward. But we've uh, we have just just you know relative to. 25 or 30 years ago, it's, it's just, uh, you know, a massive change. And uh, 
to the point where we have some you know world class world class things. Thank you, Steve. I know your time is up, but uh, if I may ask, can you uh, entertain one more question? Of uh, course. Is that okay? Thank you. Of course. You're very kind. You're very kind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. I'll just yeah, I'm just uh, I have to feed my dogs when this is done. But that's uh... <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> they can they can wait a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, before you don't get uh, get too hungry, uh, this is the last one from Shinjo. Wow, it's a big one. What are factors that make uh, startups grow to scale on a global basis to become unicorns? Japan has made so few unicorns. Yes. Okay. So, so I mean, that's, that's again, the, you know, a lot of that, you know, the digital technology, right? If, it, if the nice thing about digital is the marginal cost of a lot of things is zero. Yeah. And so once you have a product that, that people want, um, again, where you get customers. So the customers is the, the big thing. Um, number two, where there's a positive gross margin and, and in tech, that's true in a lot of cases because the marginal cost is very low. Um, that's, that's what you're looking for. And then you, you have to grow it. Um, you start in the, you know, your, you know, where you start and then you take it globally. I think the, the, the challenge maybe in Japan is if you started it in Japan, you then have to translate what you have probably into English um, because that's the global language. So it's easier, you know, if you start in the US probably to take it global, everybody uses English. If you start in Japan, then you got to take it from Japanese and, and maybe that's a, you know, it makes it a little harder. Although I, my guess is in Japan, a lot of stuff is, you know, business stuff you have uh, English as well. So, you know, that would be the story. And, and again, Masayoshi's son has done, has done okay globally. Um, so it's, uh, you have a really good example um, in your, uh, in your backyard of somebody who was you know, very aggressive, unbelievably aggressive. And uh, he's, uh, you know, hasn't been, you know, uh, you know, always successful, but, you know, overall he's, uh, he's been a real force. Well, uh, Steve, I cannot thank you enough uh, to be with us tonight. And, uh, you know, thank you for being such a, you know, great center of uh, our inspiration and aspiration for many years. And uh, please uh, keep doing so. And uh, I wish you, uh, you know, uh, and your family a very healthy and uh, prosperous uh, rest of the year 2021. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Well, thank you very much for uh, having me, and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing Japan do uh, become stronger on uh, the entrepreneurial side and private equity. And uh, now I have you in my network, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll have a startup in the new venture challenge that uh, you can help with. It, 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 might, it would be our privilege, okay? So uh, please do excellent. Time, okay. Excellent, and I and I hope to get out to Japan uh, one of these days soon. So yeah, I know you were planning to come down in December, but it's highly unlikely. So uh, you know, we would just wait for another opportunity. But uh, this is, uh, is uh, really a great, great uh, privilege of us. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you very great. much. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is uh, pretty much the conclusion of the first session, which is a special session. Uh, and I hope uh, you enjoyed it. And thanks for uh, asking a lot of uh, great questions. And, uh, you know, I always amazed how, you know, um, you know, candid and, uh, you know, uh, kind uh, the great professor like Steve and Kaplan can be. And uh, that's a beauty of uh, being part of this great alumni club. And with that, I would like to move on to the uh, shift, shift gear a little bit. And uh, we're gonna move on to the next program, which is the uh, real AGM part. So I'm gonna, I would like to pass the baton to uh, uh, Yugo Fujinami. And uh, Yugo, uh, with that. Yes. So, yeah. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, 
I was more than happy to hear uh, Steve's uh, talk. Uh, it was very inspirational and I am an entrepreneur, so I learned a lot from his speech. So uh, I'm a leader, uh, MBA full-time recruiting activity in Japan. So uh, I want to present you the current um, status of full-time MBA program. I'm a student uh, in Japan. So let me share my screen. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, this year we have 14 uh, students from Japan. Uh, some are joining us today. Uh, please welcome them with a warm applause by heart. <laughs> uh, in the real session, we make a big applause for them, but uh, they, today only I <laughs> do that. I, I really welcome new students this year. And uh, 14 is a good number, but it is a result of our journey to increase students from Japan. So let me explain our journey to get more students from Japan uh, to you uh, briefly. So this slide, uh, with this slide, this chart illustrates number of students from Japan for that over the 10 years, for the past 10 years. I believe you all have noticed small numbers until 2016. Um, I personally went to Booth in 2012. Uh, that year, there were two students from Japan, uh, including me. Uh, two is a small number, but a big problem was 2016. That year, only one student uh, from Japan. Uh, that year, some alumni noticed this unwelcome situation, and a couple of alumni had a uh, kickoff meeting to get, get more alumni and current students to do recruiting work. After that, uh, some alumni volunteered to follow up applicants and admitted students with a very organized approach in Japan. So that activity started this 2016, and we had a good result very soon. In 2017, uh, eight students enrolled in Japan. Uh, we were so excited with this result at the time. Uh, also, the school, uh, the booth, was always uh, very helpful for us. Uh, they offer strong support for our activity in Japan. In 2018 and 19, uh, former Deputy Dean Stacy Cole came to Japan to host information session for applicants. Uh, that event had uh, more than 80 applicants uh, each time. That is a big number, and the event quality was very high. Also, we had a very big flagship event, Booth Insights, in 2018, with the former Bank of Japan Governor Mr. Shirakawa and Professor Krotzner. Uh, that was a very good showcase of our community. We had uh, more than 200 people there. Uh, they are not all applicants, but including uh, some senior people uh, listening to their discussions. But it was a very good uh, showcase for Japanese people of how good Booth is uh, excellent at business education space. We planned the same kinds of events, the Deputy Dean's Information Session and Booth Insights in 2020 as well, but uh, COVID uh, hit the world and we, sh we should cancel the event at that time. But uh, we hope after COVID, we'll have big recruiting events and the Booth Insights again in Japan, uh, hopefully in real sessions. This is the short story of full-time recruiting in Japan. Also, uh, this chart explains year calendar of full-time MBA recruiting before COVID. I, my hope is uh, many people know what alumni club are doing to get more applicants and get uh, admitted students enroll in schools. So, we have three information sessions for applicants. Uh, this red one, 
The first one is with Jupiter Dean. The second one is by alumni and current students. And the third one is mainly by current students. Also, uh, we did a booth insight, so hopefully we will have another one after COVID. Uh, these are activities for applicants. But another important part of our activities is following up uh, admitted students. Um, some admitted students, unfortunately, go to Harvard, Stanford, or whatever, but we want more good people uh, to come in our community. So we are taking a very tailored approach uh, to follow up uh, admitted students. Uh, current students and uh, younger generation alumni contact admitted students one by one. And we arrange meetings with alumni, uh, including some senior, very senior experienced alumni to provide uh, admitted students with enough information to decide which school to choose. Uh, and at the same time, we, we tell them how Booth is, uh, we tell them how Booth is good. At, uh, this is a good chance to attract them for Booth. Uh, last recruiting season, we did such follow-up activities online, yeah, absolutely. But uh, we did a good job as well. So the last slide shows uh, current status and uh, request for support. Uh, given this uh, good opportunity, I want to I want to request a couple of support for all alumni here. So current status of our activities. A uh, number of applicants have significantly increased uh, for organized efforts by uh, by organized, organized efforts by alumni, students, and the school pay, really paid off. But uh, we have some issues. We are facing new issues right now. So, but are required more tailored for our approach. Uh, these are required to increase number of applicants. I mean the Japan's uh, Japan's applicants pool, good applicants pool is roughly 100 every year. So this is not a big number, but to get more good good admitted uh, good students, we need more applicants from this pool. And also increase we need to increase uh, enrollment rates of admitted students. We already uh, did well tailored approach, but we need to be more uh, sophisticated in this approach too. And the last point, increase students from diverse industries and women students. Uh, historically, Booth is very strong at finance. So uh, many alumni have finance background, in fact. But today, the uh, applicants' interests are moving from finance to entrepreneurship or more general uh, management of uh, start startup companies uh, are like that. So uh, we need more alumni who can talk about uh, management and entrepreneurship uh, uh, experiences to applicants and also admitted students. So uh, my request on behalf of a younger generation alumni for everyone is we always want alumni who can, uh, from various industries, who can chat with applicants, admitted students. Uh, so please, please uh, help us when we they contact you. Uh, it doesn't require much time just having a small chat with them, but that conversation really matters to applicants and uh, admitted students. Please, please recall when you were applicants and when you were students, uh, I don't know how many years how how many years long ago <laughs> uh, it depends on you, but uh, it sh it should be really meaningful. It it had an impact on each of you. So please help us by paying paying forward to have time to talk with applicants and admitted students. Uh, that's my uh, request for support. Uh, uh, that's my uh, my all my from my side. Uh, so let me uh, last add uh, one last thing. This year I talked only about full time recruiting, but I know many alumni here uh, from uh, from XP programs. So alumni club of Japan's next focus is to increase XP students from Japan. 
So next time, I believe we can talk about XP programs as well with XP alumni leaders uh, who is in charge of XP recruiting programs. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Okay, thank you, Hugo. And uh, I think you have a one question from Ken Mori. Okay. Can you see that? Okay, I'll see it. Uh, what are required levels of TOEFL and uh, IELTS? Um, I'm not familiar with such very latest matters because I graduated from the school eight years ago. Uh, but uh, maybe the TOEFL requirement is 107 or so. It's, it might be the minimum level. Uh, but the, um, the standard level of uh, accepted students should be higher than the minimal level. I, I, I believe around 110 or so. Uh, I have no information about uh, IELTS, sorry for that, but yeah, that, that's what I know. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Kensa. All right. So then let's move on to the next section, which is about the uh, uh, accounting report uh, of the club and uh, some uh, new initiative uh, by the alumni club. Uh, with that, uh, Nobu, uh, it's, it's for you. Sure. So, can you see my slide? Yes. Can you see me? Okay. Uh, yes. Good evening. Uh, I'm Nobu Kawai and uh, I'm a treasurer, treasurer of Alumni Club of Japan. Uh, in this part, I have two items to share with you. Uh, first one is the treasury board. And as you can see in the chart, our fund balance has constantly increased since 2018 under Yamamoto-san's strong leadership. And this year, we have kept almost the same level of balance at what I reported last year. Since most of our activities were happened remotely, the only cost incurred was homepage maintenance fee. This homepage is operated by current full-time students or prospectives in Japan. And this is the overview of uh, Treasury Report. And uh, another item is, uh, this is the main item, it's about our fund raising plan. Here is our financial situation. Our current funding resource mainly relies on one-time gifts from alumni. Um, given uh, you know crowds activities gain momentum, as Fujisami-san reported. Sorry, I started my video. Um, yeah, that's originally some reported. And we also have to prepare for post COVID physical events. We believe our challenge might be to diversify and stabilize these funding sources. So, taking this situation into consideration, um, Japan Alumni Club's board members decided to commence monthly recording gift plan which consists of three layers. One is 1,000 yen per month, and 5,000 yen, and 10,000 yen. Um, if you prefer one-time gift, we really welcome it as well. You can either email me or access gift website inquiry, inquiry form to offer it. Um, it would be much appreciated if you could take a look at this gift website for more details. Um, you can capture the QR code uh, above. <clears throat> and uh, I think I can also copy this uh, URL. Wait a moment, please. On the Zoom chat box to you all. So, so that you can copy and paste from chat, the Zoom chat box as well. I, 
and uh, at the final remote. Again, our continuous activity would not be realized without uh, your alumni general support. I hope this gift plan could get as much attention from 600 plus alumni in Japan. And also, I hope this gift could contribute to our next generation success. I uh, appreciate if, if you could share this information or this gift platform to your classmates who unfortunately couldn't attend this AGM. Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, Nobu-san, just yeah, sure. stay on this chart, okay? So sure. what this does is, uh, you know, uh, this is the app and, uh, you know, everybody can scan this uh, QR code, right? And uh, you can get into the, you know, donation site. And what you can do is uh, choose the man three gift plan among three, right? One is, uh, sure. you know, 1,000 yen per month. 5,000 uh, yen per month and 10,000 yen per month. So if you choose one of these, uh, you know, uh, you are going to uh, keep on donating this amount monthly. That's, that's what it does, right? Yes. Correct. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Nobu. Uh, this is a great initiative. And this is, uh, you know, almost like a 21st century. <laughs> we have this... Uh, uh, app based, uh, you know, the uh, fundraising, uh, uh, the uh, scheme. So uh, we really appreciate, uh, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, take a look at this uh, new initiative uh, led by uh, Nobu. And uh, if you are generous enough to uh, consider uh, coming in for this monthly gift plan, that will be a, you know, solid uh, financial basis. Uh, for our activities going forward. So uh, Nobu, thank you very much uh, for taking uh, you know, such a strong initiative within such a short time period. And uh, this is uh, quite something. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, really appreciate your, you know, uh, taking your time to take a look at this. Yeah, thank you okay. very much for your attention. Yep. So, uh, this pretty much concludes the, uh, uh, the AGM part of uh, tonight's session. So uh, is Cassie still there? Cassie? If I may ask you to say a final word uh, from you, Cassie, that would be wonderful. Okay, uh, unless otherwise, okay, that case, uh, you know, uh, thank you very much for everyone uh, and uh, for attending, uh, you know, uh, uh, our uh, AGM 2021. Uh, it's very unfortunate that we cannot, uh, you know, uh, host you physically at Tokyo American Club. That's the usual place that we have, uh, we used to have our AGM, uh, you know, before COVID. And uh, it is so unfortunate that we, we have to do this, our AGM, uh, two years in a row in this online format. And I really hope that, uh, you know, everybody and, uh, uh, and uh, your loved ones are, 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 are safe and healthy. And uh, we really do hope that uh, we can continue on this kind of, the, the, the kind of a very uh, um, exciting dialogue that we, we have uh, uh, this evening, uh, together with uh, Dan and uh, Professor Stephen Capron. And uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, going forward next 25 years, uh, Japan's uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem will simply be expanded. And uh, I, I'm sure that the alumni and uh, also the booths, uh, the U University of Chicago, for that matter, uh, would be uh, playing, uh, you know, uh, such an important role. I'm sure, uh, in nursing many of the uh, great uh, entrepreneurs and the great new businesses in Japan. So with that, uh, let us conclude uh, this year's AGM. And uh, once again, thank you very much uh, for 
attending uh, this uh, session and uh, good evening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.